What's going on, church family? Hey, we continue our devotional series in the book of Jonah today. Jonah chapter 1, verse 17, all the way to Jonah chapter 2, verse 10. If you remember the last two devotionals, we have covered the fact that God's prophet is running from him, and God's prophet, ironically, will not speak for him. If we look in verse 6, again, this is what's called the melodic line, the number one sentence that stands out in the entire book. The sailors essentially say, get up, call on your God in verse 6. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we will not perish. In fact, God is concerned about them. God is also concerned about the people of Nineveh, but Jonah is not. If you look in chapter 1, verse 14, then they, the sailors, called on the Lord, or the Eternal One, and they said, we earnestly pray, O Lord, do not let us perish on account of this man's life and do not put innocent blood on us. For you, O Lord, have done as you have pleased. That could also be considered a melodic line, at least an ironic line. Uh, this, the sense of irony is that the sailors get it. They understand what Jonah should be doing. They also understand God's heart, but Jonah doesn't understand what he should be doing. He doesn't understand God's heart. In fact, maybe it could be said that he understands it at a cold or a bitter level. God wants to save Nineveh. But Jonah doesn't understand that in the place along with the Lord. So we pick it up in verse 17 of chapter 1, and it says, And the Lord, the Eternal One, appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. What I find interesting here is uh, there is something obeying the Lord, and it's not Jonah. Not only have we seen that in the sailors, but a giant fish obeys God before Jonah does. Continuing into chapter 2, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the stomach of the fish. Uh, there was no Bible, no candle before him, but from the stomach of the fish, Jonah is praying. And he said, I called out of my distress to the Lord, and he answered me. I cried for help from the depth of Sheol. You heard my voice. You know what I find interesting in his prayer is that Jonah realizes there's assurance God is going to answer because Jonah is recognizing that God wants his will done. So from the fish, Jonah's prayer literally is quoted and sounds like this. I, I'm in the fish right now. I'm in the belly of the fish right now. And I know that you have already answered this prayer. It's from this place that you have answered me. I cried for help from the depth of Sheol. You heard my voice. He's speaking in the past tense. Interesting. Look at verse 3. For you had cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the current engulfed me. All your breakers and billows passed over me. So I said, I have been expelled from your sight. Nevertheless, I will look again toward your holy temple. I know I'm going back to Jerusalem. I know I'll be there one day. Again, he's speaking in such a way where this is a matter of fact, and yet at the same time, he's not out of the fish yet. Verse 5. Water encompassed me to the point of death. The great deep engulfed me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I descended to the roots of the mountains. The earth with its, its bars was around me forever. But you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. Verse 7, while I was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. In other words, he's the covenant-keeping God. I didn't keep my end of the bargain. And my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness. Those who go after idolatry forsake their faithfulness to you, God. But I, but I, Jonah, will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I'm tired of running. I'm going to renew myself unto the Lord. I will bring about a voice of thanksgiving. At the end of verse 90, he says, salvation or deliverance is from the Lord. Literally, I'm being delivered from the belly of this whale deliverance is from the Lord. This is a form of salvation. Verse 10, then the Lord commanded the fish, and the fish yet again did what the Lord wanted, and it vomited Jonah up onto the dry land. One thing just to summarize that I think is amazing about this passage is Jesus himself connects his own death and resurrection to le the legitimacy of this story. In 1891, a man named James Barley actually was swallowed up by a whale, and he survived the occasion. So we have historical evidence from that standpoint, but also in the rest of the Bible, we have something in Matthew chapter 12, 
verses 38 to 41. Pick it up in Matthew 12, verse 38. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, and yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Jesus just said that just as legitimate is the fact that Jonah was swallowed up by a whale and spit back up onto dry land in the same way I myself will die and resurrect three days later. Jesus connects himself to Jonah's story like chain and ball and sinker. Essentially, what he says is all the Old Testament miracles are completely true. Some would say that this story about Jonah is metaphorical. No, Jesus just made mention that this is a literal story, as is the rest of the Old Testament miracles. And in the same way that those Old Testament miracles took place, the ultimate miracle is going to take place. I'm going to rise from the dead. Uh, this is an amazing passage. The story of Jonah is actually directly connected to the death and resurrection of Jesus. We'll pick it up next week in chapter 3. God bless, church family.